Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm not sure this will be what you expect. I'm going to say some things which people might not agree with, but um, I don't really care. Um, so, Big Heritage um, is me. Um, well, I was the guy who founded it. There's uh, four of us now, um, plus a couple of volunteers, three of which are, are wobbling around York at the moment. Um, we have a staff day once a month where we make staff do something that they want to do themselves. And because I drive them to York, they decided that they wanted to go around York. So, um, so I'll give you a bit of a background of, of, of the company, my, the reason why I set it up, because it really does justify what we do and some of the strange things you might see us say on Facebook and Twitter. Um, so I came into archaeology fairly late in that um, I. Uh, I didn't get, I uh, didn't go to high, well, went to high school, but I, could, I didn't uh, manage to get onto kind of A levels or anything else like that. I had a bit of a, a rough ride in school, uh, and then um, uh, I, I pursued a number of different careers from uh, uh, travelling around the, uh, around the globe, just kind of busking my way through India, through to uh, importing wheelchairs from Taiwan, believe it or not, which makes me semi fluent in in, in, in Mandarin. Randomly, um, and also a, a series of children growing up in Taiwan with uh, Scouse accents when they speak English. Um, uh, I came back and then I started working in bars. Uh, I had a sommelier's qualification, which is really cool when you um, go to a wine shop, but that's about it. Um, and I ended up, the last job before I come into archaeology was I, I was running a uh, cold golf club bar, which is quite posh and exclusive. It was, uh, and then I got off my own bar the brew, which is a big mistake because I thought it's my own place and then I've um, gastro pub and tennis place to gastro pub and serve these wines and organic ales and, and it was like in the middle of the council estate in Birkenhead and um, long story but you know where, where I live, one side of the motorway is the one church estate where my family are all from, the other side of the motorway is the Ford estate and they hate each other and this was on the Ford estate so it was never going to work out really well. So um, after Kind of months of being kind of uh, glass bottles thrown up, smack out from toilets and everything else like this, <laughs> the kids, you know. Um, uh, by this time, um, I, I was working part of an evening in a youth club for children with learning difficulties um, as a volunteer, actually. Uh, I'd done it for about, about 12 months or something like that. Uh, and I ended up meeting the woman who, uh, who, who ran in, uh, as she ran in voluntary, uh, I'm now married to. Um, and it was kind of the end of this point. Um, uh, we, we had Grace before we got married, but um, um, I found out Jane's pregnant, and the little daughter came along, and I was in this situation thinking, I don't, I, I don't be doing this with my life. I'm coming over at four o'clock in the morning, and my daughter's asleep. I'm going to leave. You know, by the time I don't get to see her, and um, I don't, I've been very wishy-washy career-wise. And my wife says, "What do you want to do? You know, this is your last chance. And what did you want to do when you were a kid? What was your dream?" I was like, on the Indiana Jones. Um, well, yeah, I'll bring that up in a minute. So I, I, I went back and uh, um, I'll tell you, you can, I don't care to you late now, but uh, I told the fifth chest university and said that I had certain A levels, which I didn't have, and then uh, So, and I know uh, you know Megan Gondek, she's one of my uh, lecturers. Oh. Uh, but I, I got first class honours degree. Uh, and I, uh, I um, come up with a very good mark, so it was, um, I, I was okay, but I don't think you can take it off me now. Um, <laughs> got two degrees now as well, as that count? They, they all like, tumble down. Um, so when I was at Chester University, I got asked by a lot of my, um, a lot of kids that work with a lot of children, so specifically from the youth clubs that I, I, I work with in contact with a lot of children with learning difficulties, um, and also the club was based in a really kind of Socially, you know, one of the kind of most deprived areas in, in Europe, actually, in the north end of Birkenhead. Um, and the schools have to come and say, Oh, you're doing this archaeology, can you come in and just show us, or um, what can you do? And so we started going in, and then um, I, I kind of worked well with kids, I think around, around the same kind of 12 in my head. So um, they kept asking me to come back, I said, Well, no, I can't do it. Um, and they said, Oh, we'll pay you then, so you don't have to do your other job. What I did when I was at Chester University, I, I got a, a nighttime job working for an autistic society, which kind of expanded my repertoire and skills with people with learning difficulties as well. But it meant to go to uni in the week and then work at the weekends and evenings. So all of a sudden, people say, Well, come out and 
teach, uh, either do something at schools or do something at the community centre and we pay for that time. So that kind of, I went from this period saying, well, don't need to do this extra work because I'm doing some archaeological paid work. So I set up this idea of an organisation called Archaeology for Schools and the aim of it was, is when I was growing up, I'd never heard of archaeology and, and I knew Indiana Jones was, but I'd never seen an archaeologist, I'd had no exposure to it. Um, and it's amazed me, you know, there's one church, the place where uh, my kind of background is, is a massive council estate, and that's it, big concrete council estate, until you look at the fact that right in the middle of the council estate is a pre conquest church with, you know, so much hidden archaeology, but nobody knows it's there, no one in the state, the estate knows it's there. Um, and that once I got through the end of the university, I got to the point of saying, why, why is that? Um, why is it largely white middle class kids who have um, the experiences with archaeology? So I set up going out to schools. Um, so it was me working from the living room, um, uh, well, working from the upstairs bedroom, still working nights. So I'd come home and I used to kind of get my head down sometimes on the nights where I wasn't then too, but then it meant me to be able to do some work in the day. Um, and then I started realising then that it's not just about archaeology, it's about heritage as a whole, and it's not just about schools, it's about people. Um, and <laughs> we'll go through some of the projects in a minute, but one of the big kind of realisations I have is that heritage is a tool, it's not just a thing of its own right. I, I, I think heritage is something that can uh, make changes, it's dynamic, it's not a static thing in its own right. Um, and through a few chance meetings, me literally banging on doors, I got to speak to the community team at Mersey Travel, which are a massive kind of body in Mersey, so they own the tunnels, the buses, the trains. And they had a project trying to engage local children with Burberry Bank wind farms. So they had money from the European Union to say, how does a wind farm work and why, you know, how can an entire community be powered by wind? And so they were paying a fortune to hire charter big ferries, take them out to Berber Bank, thousands and thousands of pounds at a time for a couple of hours trip. And they go, oh yeah, that's it. So many megawatt hours per second, this, this, and this. And in the end, they were giving them sweets because the kids were so bored and interested that Haribo worked. So, long story, uh, how it come about, I'm really interested in place names, and I wanted to get Mersey Travel to basically put signboards on all their stations related to the place names. And they mentioned this and went, well, you know the first power, power who really used wind power to power their age was the Vikings. And anyone who goes to, to the Senate Wirral, got this mental kind of Viking thing at the moment, everyone's a Viking, everyone's got Viking blood and, and whatnot. I said, so I said to most, I said, why don't we use it to conjure it to get people interested in it? Let's use you know, this theme of Vikings as a, you know, we've got it on our doorstep you know, in, in the archaeology, but let's use some of the, you know, ignore the rapey pillagey stuff. Um, but what they did use, they powered themselves over, over from uh, Ireland or from Scandinavia using the wind. They were, uh, if anyone's ever dug on a, 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 a Viking age site, then you look to find some stuff in certain areas. Like I was at Plant a couple of years ago, and it was kind of, it was just a mud field. Um, but my argument is they reused, they recycled, they're using materials which are biodegradable. So Moore's archaeology is a, as, as a, a metaphor. Um, and also, they were, um, if anyone knows Phil Neville, the ex-Sevens and footballer, he uh, thought he was really top of the range by turf in one of the rooms of his building for um, installation. I was like, yeah, I've done that a thousand years ago. So we used these themes to kind of get kids captured uh, an imagination, we took it to Mersey Travel. Um, I'll actually tell you the story of how it went. They said, oh, well, we've got a funding pot left and we want to do this. How much is it going to cost? And I went, how much is the funding? And they went, 15 grand. And I went, or 15 grand, <laughs> and they went, okay, and that's it. So, and that was literally how, how it went from there. Oh, hang on, where am I going? Oh, you clicked. Great start, man. Um, so that's how it kind of, that was the first project that kicked us off. All right, thank you. Um, which meant, actually, they funded a full-size replica of the Arden Merkin boat, so that had just been excavated in 2011. Uh, we've got an actual image-perfect replica of that based in our, uh, in, locked up in Hoy Lake. Um, I am going to give it to Arden Merkin, I think, next year, because we haven't used it for a while, so uh, we were going to take it up there, but it's like eight hours towing a boat, and I didn't fancy it, so I'm going to tell them to come up and pick it up and they can have it. Um, we had that in the, in the middle of the Museum of Liverpool, we took it out to schools and it was all, it, we called the project Eco Vikings, I'll show it in, in a minute, the property behind it, but it was 
capturing imaginations, using a bit of archaeology, those kind of metaphors that we mentioned, but actually having a social impact away from heritage. It was about looking at how can we reduce carbon emissions. We had them signing pledges to make very small changes, such as turning the taps off every night, and if you do, Ecobank will give you a Hibernian or coin that we were stamping in. Um, so it was, a, it was using heritage as a tool, very simple, and this is the model we follow. Um, so this is what people might not agree with, but for me this is big heritage, is community archaeology for me, community first, and archaeology um, separate, a distant second. Second, but very much a second, um, compared to everything else, well behind community. And the, the things I'd say is, very simply, if you've got no community, you've got no heritage, you've got no one to interpret it, you've got no one to understand it. Um, and I mentioned this, I probably said this the wrong way the today, but um, a pot. A Bronze Age pot, without people to understand, interpret, know that there's a social element to it, it's just a shitty pot. It's it's not worth anything to us. It's got no social intrinsic value, nothing unless there's a community there to help interpret it. I don't think um, archaeology is anything without community. Um, it's a beam of on it. I've got about a certain some some realms of academia. I think that uh, there has to be a a justification of why we're spending money on certain things without having some uh, tangible benefit for people. If, you, or if you're funding research into cancer or into engineering, you can see it. Now, I know there's tangible benefits, and everyone in this room knows there are tangible benefits to archaeology beyond and outside of heritage, but the, the rest of the world might not, and I think we've got to make a, a really strong effort to, to, to look at bridging and graph, or at least telling people about it. So, Community first, archaeology second, these are our values. Um, cultural heritage is not an asset, not just an asset, it's a tool to affect social change. You can change people's lives with archaeology, uh, and that's, for me, really important that we need to be, as archaeologists, understanding we have this power. I think we do ourselves a disservice. Um, one life and one planet is one of the things we, we kind of have as a kind of a mission statement, so we try where possible to be you know, we're, um, a lot of our projects, we make sure we measure the carbon footprints of them. We, you know, we won't take any, we've had offers, right, believe it or not, offer funding for projects where we go, well, now actually we've got a doctor chat record in that, and we don't need the money that much that will soil ourselves with your, um, your, your, your core principles. Uh, we are a principal company, um, and we want to improve the planet and other people's lives through the work we do. It might be very small, and we are in small at the moment, but we've got big ideas. Um, so that's kind of the three core of the archaeological team. Um, and that's just a picture from Discovering Brom, where we've had, uh, we've seen some of the funding in a minute. Um, so these are sort of the client, clients and the funding streams. Is there a laser thing on this? Me or what There we go. Okay, so these are our kind of funding stream. I'm just highlighting that because we've had one project at HLF, um, which is less than 5% of our turnover the last 18 months. Um, so, tiny, tiny amounts. HLF are amazing, but they're not the panacea for heritage. Uh, I've got, got a bit the moment, so. um, They're not the panacea for heritage. There are, there's a lot more out there. And one of the models we've talked is to say, well, hang on, if we are making social differences, we are affecting social change, and we've had this measure, we're so into putting our social impact, and we can prove that we're having a social impact on people's health, then we shouldn't be worrying about heritage funding because we're not at health funding. Um, the fact that missed off NHS here, I've randomly enough now mentioned that one, we've had NHS funded for stuff. Um, so you can see that really mental, quite varied from kind of kind of quite you know, obvious links, but things like Mersey Travel, uh, Jones Line with Sal, which is one of the biggest property uh, agents in the UK, um, comes to the LA Productions, the film production work at the moment. And then uh, Heart Research UK. So, I won't go through all the projects, but it's just an example of um, you can take a step back away from archaeology as being, it's so easy to just be ingrained in this whole world of archaeologists, your mates are archaeologists, you only follow archaeologists on Twitter, etc. And you think, well actually, that's not the real world. Sometimes we do live in this little mad bubble. Um, and you step outside and you think, well, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. We might be called archaeology, but it's, uh, you know, uh, improving mental health, social isolation, um, environmental. We do this anyway, but we don't show as much about it. So, yeah, that's our kind of um, some of our key clients. So, kind of uh, Land's End, 
we'll, we'll pick up on it in a second. That's owned by this guy, these guys called Heritage GD that own about uh, 10 outdoor uh, sites around the UK. And so we're now kind of the de facto heritage team for their group. But I mentioned Land's Edge, that's one we've been working on a bit this summer. Um, there's our Eco Vikings, that's our boat. There's Hillbury Island there in the background. Um, and for the press, you've always got to have some like BB Vikings. I don't employ these guys. Um, uh, but that was our, our, our the Merkin boat there. And we ended up winning a national award for that project. We had um, one of the things we do spend money on actually is external evaluation. It's all really good to toot your own horn, but if someone else toots it a bit louder for you, then it's more justified. So we do spend thousands of pounds each year on evaluation. We work with John Moores University, we've got a, a health and public welfare social team that actually are. Um, have a unit that companies and other other organisations pay for and they come as an independent kind of they'll come in, sit with people who would work with and say give them a case study, come back and visit them in a couple of months time and it helps us work out what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong but also shows the funds that it's not just us saying this guys, we can, we can prove it uh, and so we got awarded that um, last year so it's for this project which is really cool because cool it had, uh, I don't remember Andy Crane from the broom cupboard I believe the presenter, and um, I, I don't get starstruck, okay, like I've met like loads of famous people, but for some reason I was like, it's Andy Crane, and I always remember it, so uh, I went up and we had this award, and um, he was talking about uh, Ed the Duck and, and whatnot, and I asked him for a photo, and he went, what now? I went, yeah, because I won't be able to see after the stage, so the whole award had to stop us and found the camera for me to have a photo of Andy Crane, but it's up in the office. Um, okay. So this is a project we're about to finish on Saturday, actually, and that goes back to Jones Lang LaSalle. Jones Lang LaSalle are one of the biggest, prop, the Chicago based, I think, but they own 96 shopping centres around the UK. Um, they come up with it for a challenge. Um, they had some money, they've just spent a lot of money refurbishing a shopping centre. And we'd sat on this idea for a while about a project called Finds Without Frontiers, which is basically literally getting stuff out of museums and taking it to people. Um, and believe it or not, there's a, a very well-meaning, cool guy called uh, Steve Harding who does a lot of Viking type stuff in Wirral. And uh, they asked him first because he's connected because this is a real actual project. But, uh, but he, wa he wanted to use the money to build a big Viking statue. Um, uh, oh, he's, run it, he's got this Viking project, and then so we were the next people in line. So what could we do? They said, right, okay. So we gave us an empty shop. We had six weeks, uh, a budget and to try and engage as many people as we can. From a commercial perspective, they want more people to come into their shopping centre. Dead simple, they're the clients, and that's our aim to do it. So what we did, we had a lovely project called Discover in Bromber, a really small uh, community excavation. I think it was 32 test pits in Bromber Village. Um, and HLF funded, 10 grand. Um, it's now a case study uh, on the northwest page. You can see that there. Um, so what we did was we went back to those people that we worked with. That was always a very community-focused project. If anyone had seen the videos and the tweets, it was we just kind of handed it over to them, but uh, directed you know, the kind of research elements of it. And we asked them to curate what they'd done. So we, we said, we've got some new money now. This is an extra of money. So what we're going to do is curate what you've found. Um, so these boards, this is the shop kind of being put up together. This is how we kind of find a look. But, each picture there is an individual person from one of the projects who some people kind of volunteered to curate. They told their own story of the project, then they took one of the finds, either they found themselves or they had them more of a, you know, a link to, if you like, and they went away and researched it. We um, kind of left them to it in a sense in how they interpreted it. Uh, we kind of called it cu cu community curation, and anyone who follows us on Facebook knows a bit of a scrap that went on of a few people saying that we shouldn't be allowed to do this because we haven't, uh, they're not the expertise, and, um, it should be a professional creation stuff, and we were like, oh, it's all shit, basically. Um, it's a temporary project, it's um, towards its, um, the story that we were telling with Discover and Bromber was actually less about the finds, and again, more about the community and how they discovered uh, each other, literally, uh, in terms of kind of new friendships and groups, and uh, so we let them curate that. So we started that last one there, C3PO's arm. Um, so that end of the room starts in the, in the Mesolithic and it goes up kind of um, to 1977. Um, we found a little C3PO arm in the church and it went third, like semi viral on, on Twitter because some super Star Wars nerd in America picked it up and um, 
told me it was like 1977, first edition, this is the serial code, this is the box it would have been in. So he was obviously uh, paused for a minute to stop torturing his cat to tell us to know all these details about this, so that, that was pretty cool. Um, it does let us indulge in our own interests as well. Um, all the staff have their own research interests, so uh, I'm losing one of my staff this summer for his uh, going back. Uh, well, I can't say that. Um, no, I'm not. Um, so anyway, one of my other staff is interested in uh, stone sculpture, uh, Anglo-Saxon stone sculpture. We're looking at quite an interest in replica in the world. So we got um, she, we've got the original Overchurch runic stone, which is uh, kind of Anglian period, um, only runic inscription in Cheshire. Uh, very sadly, been stuck in the basement of Wirral Town Hall for a number of years, um, and it's, for me, it's the jewel in the crown of this whole community's archaeology. So we managed to get the Grove Museum to who had owned it but had not been able to display it. So we've gone to Wirral and they decided to take it off display. And anyway, there's a bit of a wrangle, so we got it, and then we were able to get uh, it reconstructed. This is its kind of reconstruction hovering in the air. It's made out of kind of uh, fat, like a special fibres, resin, etc. So. We have some really good projects that have been really improved the heritage in this sense, i.e. this stone that most people haven't seen it before, haven't displayed for years, no one had got scripts of what it may have looked like it was fully reconstructed, and Joanne's just handed in a PhD in, in, in this type of field, so we're the right person to do the right job, and corporate money to be able to do it, which is always awesome. Um, so that, that's been, it's the last day on Saturday and, and on Wednesday we, hit, we opened three days a week and we've hit 7,000 people through the door, which is more than uh, the local museum we were with, unfortunately, actually. Um, but it's a, it's a really salient point because there, there's a lot of discussions going on in the world at the moment about uh, closures to Williamson Art Gallery <coughs> Museum. Um, is there a need for it? And we've got a strong case to say, <coughs> yes, there is a need. People are interested in, in their own heritage. This went out to a shopping centre in, in Birkenhead. Um, this museum has been a, a blind success. Uh, to the point that we've got another 31 shopping centres to do over the next three years now. So if anyone lives near Chelmsford or in Bishop Sturford, um, we'll, uh, that's our next two. We're going to be heading down there. Um, and in all seriousness, there, there might be some overlooks for some work for us to bring in freelancers to do some of those because We've done really well in Wirral because we know the archaeology. Um, if we could decide to stick with the archaeological themes in other areas, we want to kind of say, well, bring someone in and pay for someone to kind of help us on that. So, uh, so these are some of the observations that we've actually come when because we overlap with archaeology, but not all the time. Um, so, the first thing I, I've noticed is that uh, have we forgot how we love what we do as archaeologists? This is all leading back to why I think we've done all right. Um, as, as, a, as a marker of what I think is we've done all right is we're still trading, no one's, everyone gets their wages paid, we're not making a loss, paying all the bills. That, that is a success in this, in this climate, so we're not driving around Porsche, is success, but everyone's uh, earning an income. We're taking on new staff again, um, in where well, a lot of people are laying off, so success is relative. Um, but sometimes I do feel like there's a case that we need to express to people what we love, what we do. I mean, I'd imagine most people in this room have gone and seen something in a museum or on a, you know, in a landscape and made an, an inappropriate noise because it's been like, I got shouted at the British Museum and uh, I saw uh, Silver Dale Hall and it was the first time on display and I went, oh, and I made this noise and the guy was like, are you okay? Um, and sometimes we, I, I, you've got to remember that we do that still and we're quite young and maybe you could call us naive big characters, but that rubs off on the people we work with that we are excited about archaeology. Uh, Discovering Brom, we found a piece of uh, like a ring, some Roman orange work. Now, we're about 12 miles from Chester, so a Roman fort, but there been no Roman pottery ever found in Brom. Uh, so we just, we were, all, we were excited that this had come out. Um, it kind of rubs off to the point that Granada tonight came out and filmed it, and, and they were coming out, I was like, well, should we tell them that like, nationally it's not actually that significant? We've got no bugger it. Um, <laughs> so we got them around tonight, the local papers and stuff, and we'll come on to media and press in a minute. But we love what we do, and sometimes when you go to conferences, it's all very, oh, unless something massive comes out, it's very kind of, um, very academic, very kind of set out. And I think sometimes we can do a bit more to just to jump up and say, 
brilliant. What we do is awesome, and tell more people about it, please, with me. Um, and I think we do take ourselves too seriously with, 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 with certain things. I got a, a very interesting uh, comment, um, I'm not going to say who's from, but from a, an archaeologist, because uh, in and around the Brom Road, we do, we do things called big school digs, where we go out and do a one metre test pit in the school. Uh, we go through, uh, and it's, it actually is recorded stratigraphically. It uses the same kind of, use the same recording system Carenza Lewis, who pinched it off, uh, off Cambridge because it, it was really good. Um, all the fans, we have a database of schools and we're actually mapping school uh, material culture. But we have a really long kind of winded email saying that, you know, this is sacred kind of archaeology, this, and uh, we shouldn't be doing out there with and this, that, and the other. And there are, you know, grounds to say that might be. Be correct, but the same school as we were digging that, we're digging up foundations for a new building, or we could have been doing a community garden. You put a spade in the ground sometimes and call it archaeology, and all of a sudden we can take it too seriously. Now, I don't mean by any means that kind of things like proper recording, taking things to the HER, making sure it's in public domain, are that should be followed because they should. The Scrum Brom 2, uh, so the Scrum Brom Road, we are just about finishing the report, and HLF funding ended months and months ago for that, and we're about to kind of finish the report, we've done it, you know, by the book. But, um, going to do a one metre test pit in a school, in a deprived area, when you have the parents waiting outside to come and see this test pit, can actually make a difference to people's week, day, lives, even it can get them really excited. It doesn't need a research agenda, it does not need a research framework to put a one metre hole in the ground, and I'll, I'll argue blue in the face of anyone who disagrees. It's a way of actually getting people understanding the method of archaeology, and why it's exciting, and why it's important. And if we don't do things like that, and it could be field work, um, it could be uh, landscape archaeology equally, but if we don't get young people excited in that way, it's something that will grip them, um, then there'll be no one to vote for uh, next time they say, well, let's put a hole through that, or let's trash that, because they won't care, because we haven't done our job. So I think. We could, uh, these two probably the same, didn't take yourself seriously and are too risk averse and stuff. And just think about risk averse, it's, it's, the bigger the organisation we work for, um, heritage wise, the more risk assessments that we have to do. And that's probably me just having a moan because I don't like giving risk assessments for every little party thing. But, so you can imagine when we ran pitch gladiator battles in the New Zealand of Liverpool, it was uh, a nightmare. But they did it, they let us do it. Um, and then this one, I'm going to explain this now, do express ourselves to the right people. It leads back to me making sex noises in the museum. Um, so this is a big bump, okay? I'm going to explain why there's a big bottom on the picture. One of our projects we've got with the Wellcome Trust looks at the archaeology and medicine. It's got the Road Medicine Roadshow. They've uh, refunded it. It's, it's been a, a broad success with schools, and it's about using Roman medicine, specifically the archaeological um, context of it. So, um, finds that have come out of Britain, uh, massive strong points on osteoarchaeology, looking at evidence for the kind of disparity between um, Romano British kind of bones that show poor healing, poor fracture setting through to, and, and then ones that are fantastic and we work with um uh, Becky Redfern at the Museum of London filmed on it, Ralph Jackson who's the Mr. Roman Medicine at the British Museum. Um, and this is just an example to explain us taking ourselves too seriously or worrying. We Go to a lot of operations and based upon the Roman medical tools of, of uh, and using Galenic text of saying, well, this is probably how these tools are used. And there's one that always brought up the smiling classes, which is when we look at uh, uh, the removal or the, the repair of anal fistula, which requires all sorts of, as you can imagine, odd contraptions. Um, we went to Big Bang Science Fair, we had 75,000 people over four days, um, and we panicked as Rolls Royce, all the engineering companies and some of the stands were 30, 40 grand was like, right, we're not going to ever compete with that. Um, so we just got a massive bomb made and uh, stuck it on the table and we had all the surgical tools, uh, all perfect copies. Ralph Jackson sat there and gone, I love these, these are brilliant. We even had this guy called Professor Roger Nebo, the Wellcome Trust surgeon, who was like, these would go in my toolkit, they were really well made. And we decided to go we have always had this trepanning wig, and we should explain trepanning by putting a wig on a kid's head, and it's got different layers, it costs us a few bob, and you can remove the score with the, and explain how the theory of trepanning works, and then we show the archaeological evidence, we've got skull casts where it's slightly, you know, the bones running back and stuff. So we bought, it cost us 100 quid to get a bomb made, and 
it arrived at the house. Um, the guy dropped it off, and he said, uh, "Well, he was like, it's like a big sex toy. I'm really sorry because that's what it is. It's like latex." And he's like, "I'm not sure." <laughs> but I, had, I did have an email halfway through, and uh, uh, the guy saying, "This is a really awkward question, but how wide do you need your anus to dilate?" Uh, and, uh, if you ever been to our office, we've got all this mad stuff. It's kind of like being in kind of Alice in Wonderland. But do you know what? We uh, went to Big Bang. It was about like we had two osteo osteoarchaeologists with us. We did have we have also Lindo Man with full size replica Lindo Man, which is just amazing. Um, and so we checked out it was a crime scene, CSI scenes. The kids had to go with all this mask and kit on, but it was explaining how archaeology explains the demand. But with this, we stuck this bomb on the table. Um, we had to get crowd control after halfway through the first day, um, and the manager of the Big Bang said, why didn't you get the exhibition space? He was like, because we've got a table with some stuff on. He said, um, the bigger, the more expensive stand, the less that people were interested in it. It was about doing something that engaged people and captured imagination. So this was a risk because we had schools, potential new customers, because um, we will go out and do schools, but uh, this is about taking a risk that actually paid off. Uh, uh, and, and it's called Gideon, by the way, that's its name. Um, so, something else about explaining stories to the right people. One of our clients, I don't know if you've seen the story, um, Heritage GB, or a number of sites are actually based in Albert Dock, and that comes through a lot of network and a lot of evening kind of snoozing and um, it come about actually I defended the honour of Cornwall Cornish archaeology despite actually personally knowing very little about it but I was at a, an event with the financial director of Land's End uh, and a, a barrister who slammed into Cornwall saying he used to go to his kid there's nothing there and it's absolutely rubbish and I was really drunk and defended Cornwall to the hills of prehistory and everything and, and this guy from Land's End took like my kind of call to arms as a sign of, you know, this guy really packed So he invited us down to the site, and when we went down on the site, it's a really tacky tourist destination, I'm sure don't mind you telling that, but they've got plans to change it. We've done a, you know, simple HDR kind of search, and it was littered, it was kind of, we couldn't see the site because of the dots, because of the amount of fines, and uh, from um, unscheduled, um, uh, Neolithic, uh, well, Bronze Age slash Neolithic, we don't know yet, Chambers through to a Bronze Age cemetery, though. Uh, Iron Age f uh, f field boundaries, they've got literally like this timeline of, of British history, it's amazing on this site, which they knew nothing about. Um, so they've actually brought them to position now of spending you know, well over six figures over the next 12 months to interpret the site, to actually pay for anything that needs to be done to get that monument scheduled in a good state of the They've put metal detecting signs of saying, you know, you'll be prosecuted and stuff. They didn't have to do this, this is, again, this is corporate money. Um, and when, on the last day, um, we were only there for two days just as a kind of, is there anything for us to do? And as we were going to get down, and we realised there's a lot here, it's amazing. This old guy who works on the site comes and said, oh, these rabbits are uh, outside my shop. He's a, you know, he runs a little craft shop and uh, he says, look at these funny old stones. And it was just like this handful of um, Mesolithic and Neolithic tool. Has anyone seen the picture on the website? It was just like, wow, it's amazing. Um, so this is just a quick example of how you can twist the media to listen to your story and sell archaeology. So we went and phoned up the Daily Mirror and said, you won't believe what's happened. And this, and this guy from South East reports a bunch of rabbits have rewritten really the history of Land's End. And he's like, what do you mean, what do you mean? He's like, it's, it, we're on this site and these archaeo bunnies have kind of <laughs> dug this material up. And it wasn't known properly on this site. Now we didn't say, it was done months and months, this guy's managed to have his box for a few months, that, that's called a lie. But, um, <laughs> um, but then we said, come on, let's make this, and the guy was really into it, and sometimes you just get that person who loves archaeology, and, and you know the opposite, when you get someone in your, they're, they're like, mm, don't care, but then you only get the right person, he's like, oh, I love this story. So they come out, took photos, um, I think the, the title it was The Mirror It Went In First, and they, they put it, Heritage site, so that was his kind of fun for it. Like, oh my god. So we left it and thought, right, got it in the national papers. Land's End is our client, we're absolutely made up because we've got them in the national papers. We've got a three year project with them actually, and this was just kicking it off. Over 120 grand and growing, quite a uh, advertising equivalency value. They've told us that that's more than their papers up to now, by the way. Um, just, just look to that. Oh god, that one. Uh, that's 
Moscow State Television who'd come out to film the rabbits at Land's End. Um, <laughs> rabbits weren't there, they couldn't see, they had to wait for hours for these rabbits to come out. It's like, you could just use any picture of a rabbit, there's nothing to be a Land's End rabbit. Um, another lie, actually, by the way, I sent the mirror a picture of one of the Land's End rabbits, and it was one of them Google image of rabbits. <laughs> So, um, I laughed in the face of the image copyright. Um, so, yeah, that was that, that came out of that. And then Chicago Tribune, we ended up on the Chicago radio. I went up till three in the morning to speak to them about it. Guardian, Mira, Independent. So, Land's End just overjoyed. And that was our first bit of work we did for them. And, you know, we tripped over that. But in all seriousness, we know how to. We love archaeology and we, we, we get excited by it. And this is my point. If you don't get excited by it, no one else will. This guy got excited about it because we were. Um, but you can sell your stories, and not for cash. Um, but things like the Roman pottery of through to this. You need to tell the right people in the right way. Um, this is another really interesting story. Now, that's me, and I didn't come up with this title. This is our Lindo Man guy. Um, it looks much nicer when he's on the floor and he's been covered up. But, uh, um, we have a big, uh, we have a, all our profits at the end of the year that we make get reinvested into a number of different our aims and objectives, and they're not always heritage, it's different ones. And we end up uh, having enough money in this year to, there's a, a foundation in Kenya called the Mamusi Foundation, it's a school um, in Kenya that's designed to, uh, one, of, one of the key things it wants to do is get girls continuing in education, and they're actually te 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 teaching them how to code. There's a lot of kind of Facebooks and Silicon Valley companies are moving into into Kenya, there's no local skills and bringing them in from other countries, China and everything else. This school's gone in there and they're trying to get these girls who are kind of being married off at 12, 13 to a 70 year old guy and saying to the elders of the village workers, saying, train these girls up, get them to be coded, and the guys at the first. Um, and then they're going to be able to bring wealth back to your village and everything else. So, um, but there's an organisation, there's a lot of work that's gone on in Liverpool where it's kind of was born out of. But the other unique thing they've done is got um, County Kirk there, which is a really, really the pride area of Liverpool. They're working with a really um, group of young people over a really crap start in life, basically. So what they do is they're going to take them out to Mamusi, out to Kenya, and they're going to um, work together so the Kenyans can teach these kids some skills and, and, and about life, really, and vice versa. Um, so anyone who's been a client of ours, like um, there's two guys from Museum of Liverpool, and you've paid for some of the projects we've delivered in, from the education department. So there's a, a, a lad from Kirk there who's off to Kenya in two weeks' time, and that's we personally gave him the cash to do that, and we'll see that through. So, um, but anyway, just come back to the bomb body. We've worked with Museum of Liverpool, we've had it out that day, we've had something called the Dead Good Workshops, where we explore all sorts of um, death and burial. And um, uh, we had to pack it up and the awards were on the same night and it was like an hour so we didn't have time to go back, pack it up in the, in the car and then headed off to Anfield where the awards were uh, held. Um, I had to present the award and, and the other, it was called Community Superstars and it was another fundraiser for this. Um, and I've come out to the car and realised a lot of stuff had been robbed, that the window had been smashed and it was a bit annoying. Um, but we had all this stuff in, in, in the back, all the museum gear. So they robbed the bag. It was, I was more annoyed about the bag because it was a, a nice bag. Um, it was like a replica bronze axe, uh, a, a replica of the Huxley Silver Horse. They must have properly thought they'd hit Josh Popper and Punch, made out of pewter. Um, so there's all sorts of bits and pieces and, and an iPad. But in a box at the back, they pushed open to get the boot into the boot. And there was a box with Lindo Man on the top and it slid down. And <laughs> <laughs> there was another head in a box, I won't explain why, there was another head in a box and a bog body head, replica of course. So I was annoyed and then we'd gone home at night and I'd, I'd been speaking to some community people at the awards about kind of restorative justice and how, you know, just simply blanketing people with scumbags and stuff was never helping anyone. So that was in the head and I put this idea for saying, right, if you're out there, share this Facebook status, if you're out there, bring this stuff back. Um, come and work just for a couple of weeks. Um, we'll find you a work placement, we'll, we'll get you in touch with job centres if you're young or you're in training, you want to get into training, we'll, you know, we're not going to give you a job, but we'll, you know, help you out. And apparently we, couldn't, uh, we had to delete it, we were going to say we weren't press charges, but we had to delete that, apparently it was illegal. Um, <laughs> but um, that got 350,000 Facebook views. Ridiculous amount of shares. It's still going on, it's going on, there's a massive row going on on Facebook with people saying we shouldn't have done it. People said they should. Uh, the pages picked it up. 
Um, and I, again, slightly stretch the story to say that these ran off because we were so frightened. Um, <laughs> this went to the this went into the national papers again. It got picked up by the Echo, and we got um, we've got two contracts out of this story, which is worth far far more than the excess on the window that we have to pay. Um, so again, it's a, a, an interesting way of taking a bad situation. Um, does anyone watch Raster Mouse? You probably don't because you're not kids. But I've got a young daughter who watches this program called Raster Mouse. It's like this patois Jamaican mouse that goes around solving crimes. Um, but he seems to have this restorative justice, like he gets the criminal and makes them realise they're in their own ways. Makes a bad thing good. Makes a bad thing good. Well, I what makes a bad thing good on this. So now we got we got tweeted by official Raster Mouse. <laughs> Wagwan, big heritage. And stuff. So we, got, we, we, we overnight I tripled off like Twitter and Facebook followers and stuff like that. And I, you know, regularly have a few DMs with Rasta Mouse. And um, but it, 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 that's our community ethos, really. But also, it's how we play the media. Um, they're a tool. The media. They're not. What you've got to remember with newspapers is someone like the Liverpool Echo. Um, they need a story every single day, and. You've got so many stories that you, you can just tell them. They come back. I've got two missed calls, and I know who it's off because we've got a project that I've mentioned to some of the Echo, and he wants it first. And I haven't asked me for the phone because I'm busy, but he will he'll wait because you know I'll give him the story, but then I'll know we'll get more PR out of it. Pete Papers want your stories. The simplest thing is always have your photos, right? I'm not telling this into a press session, but always have good photos and always have the press release all done for them. And it can be really lazy and sometimes copy and paste it, even if you spell the mistakes into an article. Uh, so, if anyone's kind of followed why we've got a lot of media coverage and stuff right recently, because we're just a bit, a bit clever about the, some of the things that how we, what we think is a story, you might not realise could be a great story. Um, a good one is anyone works in museum archives, go and find something that no one's seen for a while, that's stuck in a box and say, oh, rediscovered. Everyone loves a rediscovered one. Um, <laughs> Why not? Um, that's watching TV. So these are some of the good bits that we do outside of what we do with our profits. Well, because we, we do make profits. I'm not, not. I'm quite proud. In fact, we made profits, but we reinvest it. Um, so we do kind of very ad hoc guerrilla stuff. On so we go out and take a load of stuff relating. We're doing stuff at the moment related to the 50s and 60s actually, and going out to people in nursing homes who were. In the prime of their lives in the 50s and 60s, or you know, early 40s, you can say here. And we do this for now, it's oh, absolutely no cost immediately because we enjoy it as well. Um, staff, all our staff, salary, sick pay, holiday pay, no one's on zero contract hours, um, and no one will be. The other thing is with volunteers, we love volunteers. We've had a few come in and gave a day a week, and then we help them you know, move on to jobs if there's no jobs here, but we wouldn't have kind of free. I don't personally, morally, would not say come and work 40 hours a week for six weeks for no money as a if we work experience. It's bullshit if you do the job, you get paid, and that's our. Uh, we've got something coming up in the summer, we're going to offer replacement. Short term, it's paid because it should be. Um, but these things we do for free, as in we don't charge the end user. Um, and this is epic, that's Joanne at Land's End, it's just a really good photo. We get to do stuff like this, we kind of um, Land's End. Brilliant clients, beautiful locations, um, bar tab, um, which is really good. We actually had an accidental bar tab because the first time we went, we said, we'll go down to see what's there with charger. He said, oh, we'll stay with the bar tab and you know, have a room for the night and stuff. And now they pay us and we haven't got rid of the bar tab and they haven't got onto it, so we're going to carry on. Um, so you know, we get to go to places like this, do things really differently. Um, we're very small, like everyone here is 12 months away from doing what we've done. And it's, it's so much more awesome in some respects than working for a massive organisation because we want to do something, we go, go ahead then, um, try it out, plan it. Um, or we can just do things off the fly, whereas you can take six months to get something off the ground if you've got a lot of hoops to jump through. So whilst you might be like, ooh, like, you know, it's only me, you need to see that as a bonus because you can do stuff that people can't do um, or big organisations can't do. One of the things that we've done. We've had a few comments from different museums who've gone, we'd love to do this stuff, but we can't because of X, Y, Z. You're all the guys who can do that stuff, I think, in my opinion. Um, some bad bits, it is hard work. We do it like, I get up really early. Um, Parsons has got like, a little boy at the moment who thinks five o'clock is socially acceptable. So I get up and I'll do a couple of hours of work before my wife's out of bed. And when this all started kicking off, I was working 
I was doing a full time degree and a full time job, and I had a kid, it was killing me, I had properly hard work, but you can get through that stage, you're up and running. And it's not all like this level, we're not massive as well, we're tiny, but it still took me, you know, in 2011, just kind of when we started moving, it took us that time just to get to this place. Um, uh, and actually, you might get to different people you wouldn't expect off um, from your own community as archaeologists, um, which it's come about face for us now, actually, um, in a couple of different ways. I, um, you know, I won't kind of mention organisations and stuff, but things like, you can't do that, you're not, you haven't got the experience to do that, or you haven't got, you're not qualified to do that, and you're not an archaeologist because you haven't worked for a commercial unit for five years, and we have, so we should be doing that. And, um, that kind of sticks in your throat a little bit, but um, the only way to kind of get past it is just to prove that you can, basically. So they're the only kind of bad, the real bad bits. The, uh, financially, if you're kind of going on, on your own independently, it's one thing I'd say to everyone uh, is get a job, like another job if you need to, a night time job. If you really want to do it, then kind of do what I did, like scale it like that, get another job, do your archaeology, and then make the archaeology pay, and then do your other job less. If you can, I mean, I was literally wiping bums in an autistic centre. I've got a lot of experience working with people, but it's a horrible, sometimes, you know, difficult job, um, but it funded what, what, what got, got to in that sense. Um, I'm going to have a quick chat about the CIC model, and then kind of waffling, but, um, and look at the School of Social Entrepreneurs. So CIC has been around for a while, actually, CIC, it's kind of the, the bridge between a charity and a business, um, and it effectively allows you to run like a business. In fact, we, we are quite hard on profit-making company, no doubt about it, but we have profits at the end of the year is reinvested into our aims and objectives, which um, actually our aims and objectives are improving people's lives uh, through the use of heritage and however broad that we do that. Um, so things like the Lomusi Foundation stuff, we can, actually, we can either put cash into it or we, we, can, we can afford with our time to do other things. Um, CIC is much easier to set up than a charity. It can lead on to charitable foundations. So I'm working with another group at the moment, Merseyside, who are set up as a CIC, but it's got, you know, it's got its aims. It's a charitable. It should be a charity, but I think they need to get to a certain level before they do that. Um, so in that sense, it, it, it's, it's really, really good. And the School for Social Entrepreneurs is um, a movement, social entrepreneurism, is about how I think that the economy needs to start changing to look at the third, triple bottom line of businesses, so your bottom line, i.e. profit, but that, 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 that beyond that is what is the bottom line to the community, what are you, how are you improving the world, people's lives, people's health, through your business activities. There's something, Google this called the Social Value Act, and it's passed now, but it's not really started to kick in, or any contracts that are government, i.e. Um, and I would be interested to see HLF's position on this, because no one's answered it. Um, any funding that's public funded, has now uh, got to prove its social value. So you've got two companies, two archaeological companies that are doing a project for Wirral Council, for instance, and the two are bidding for it. All are equal, okay, everything else is equal, but one is doing something that has a value to the community. So they say, well, we're going to get the community involved with this, we're going to help them do this side of things, we're going to leave the heritage thing behind. Then, technically, to the letter of the law, they've got to give that to the company, even if actually it's more expensive, because the social value can outweigh the costs. So my argument is with HLF, it's public funded money. So when they're spending money on contractual kind of companies who are coming into the, not, I'm not saying it's wrong, but you're, you've got a construction company fixing 100 church roofs, where's their social value? Are you measuring their social value? Because technically, maybe it should be. Um, so uh, social value, act, I think it's got an impact with heritage. I think heritage can um, really change people's lives. And we should be asking, construction firms, HS2, uh, any big development, what is your social value? And it could be that they're building a community centre, it could be that they're building a, uh, a playground or investing in a local health thing, or it could be the uh, paying money to ensure that local monuments are preserved, that heritage interpretations are being done, that proper um, heritage kind of groups locally are being given money to do their work around their developments. That's social value, and that should be coming out of construction by law now, construction people's uh, budgets. So I got invited, um, I'm a bit of a lefty rantist at times, I think that's probably right, but um, I'm, I got involved on the School of Social Entrepreneurs, which is a number of programmes, and I, I, I consider you look at applying for them in your region. Um, 
And one scale up is for businesses who are looking to really make a change in how they operate and do things differently. And it's backed by Lord's Bank, and Lord's Bank, Lord's Bank gives 15 grand and we've got in touch with some really big hitters in, in, in big business and stuff. And we've got a social franchise model that's on its way soon where we're going to look at doing big heads of South, um, which will follow all our aims and objectives and models, but it's going to be run some separate business. So we'll map it's kind of like a Subway franchise, but again, with that social side of things. Social franchise, you've Google that as well. Um, so that's worth having, having a look into. Um, although, a slight warning on this, because I know there's a, a, this overlap between funding and careers. Um, if you're not community focused, because not everyone is, or you don't see a value in something, don't just look at this as a place where I'll get some money and say this. Um, that everyone who works with us lives and breathes some of the values, that, or all of the values that we have, otherwise it wouldn't work for us. Um, and I don't think morally you should be going out looking for community funding or saying, do you know what, I'm going to come to CIC because I can't get, and then I'll be able to get this grant because I can't get a job. Unless you go, well, actually, what's the problem? What's the issue? I think we can solve this issue with this. It's going to have a big social impact. It would work better structures at CIC than I'm going to do it. Don't see it as the other way around. Um, that's my personal opinion. I think morally you shouldn't do that. So, um, some tips to take away. I'm going to, this is Don Draper. Um, and, um, We've got a, a drinks cabinet in our office, we have a drink and I get, everyone uh, mocks me and there's a photo of a fat Don Draper in uh, our office, um, sitting in a chair, someone's probably spent two hours of my team's time making the Don Draper with my name, Bad John, looking like me, because I happen to say we should have a little drink on a Friday afternoon and stuff like that, but if you're all partaking the drink, you still call me uh, Don Draper, but these are some tips in terms of if you're going to be businessy about being you know, entrepreneurial, um, so, archaeologists, your peers, not your paymasters, so don't always hang about with archaeologists if you're looking for new work or you're, or you're thinking about expanding or setting up a business. The simple fact is, you're not in the right circles, you need to be looking at. Um, I recommend you go to your school of social entrepreneurs, go to, uh, we're members, corporate members of about four or five different businesses and networking clubs, and we're going to be uh, hopefully looking at doing big heads uh, commercial in the next 12 months, so we're going to be doing commercial archaeology with a social angle to it, so um, we're going to be trying to um, put something new in the market really about how we do commercial archaeology, but it's about the architects, it's about the, 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 the developers, and they don't knock about museums unfortunately, um, so you've got to kind of look at the business communities that you're in. Um, so network a lot, so I, you know, or someone, in, you know, whoever you are, going to these events are always outside of work hours, so um, unfortunately it's extra time commitment, but go and see things, go and go and visit, open, get, get on the list of openings of galleries, go and uh, um, schmooze, as, uh, as Gary Michael says that I do, but um, get your face known about it anyway. Um, Hannah Twitter, I'm sorry, I, I, I think last year we, we got about 20% of our business, which is a bit of a fluke because we have a big contract on it, but from Twitter, we tweet a lot about what we do, we, we're very socially kind of we put a lot on Facebook and Twitter, but if you don't do it, I just recommend it. So it's like for Facebook, for, for, for people who can say it in less characters. Because um, they're more intelligent. Um, and do free stuff as well. I, you know, if some, do a bit of volunteer or someone says, could you do this for this? Fine, but value your time as well, so don't do it all the time or say, well, no, I'll charge you for this. Because we get asked constantly, can we do a talk on this or can we do this for free? And we already have a social value, we know how much money we're giving back. And you're good at what you do, you're qualified, you could be solicitors now, earning a fortune and earning, like, well, our accountants put it this way, charge us 180 quid an hour. So if you phone up somebody's going to do a talk for half an hour, I'm not expecting to go for 180 quid. Um, but charge something, um, don't do anything for free to that, you know, to that extent. Um, you're all good at what you do, and I think it devalues archaeology as a whole. And it does worry me that, um, I won't name the shame, but there's some. Um, uh, commercial archaeology firms I know who do uh, a lot about getting people to volunteer uh, or to just get some student experience. You're like, they're a master's student, they've done archaeology for four years. You're doing it because it's free labour and you're getting your profit it, it increases. So just don't do shit for free. Um, so that's about it, really. So I'm going to probably open myself to rotten fruit and everything, but uh, it's a really different way of, well, maybe not so different, but it's, it's a bit slightly tangible away from what we sort of call a kind of standard archaeological company, but we're doing all right. Um, if we come back next year and still here, that's a, a, a sign of success. So 
Uh, anyone wants to kind of take any brains or anything? Do you have any questions? Did you, we've obviously covered kind of economic and political security over the last few years. Heritage and archaeology is kind of protecting and preserving it. It's kind of struggled a little bit because of like less funding to do so. But obviously, stuff like yourself doing what we all kind of do, because we're seeing the um, kind of the other side of the bit. The profile is raising as far as immersing into the social value, the community value, and it's obviously creating jobs for people like ourselves. And it's um, you know, actually a big firm that people identify are investing in it. Do you ever see the kind of a, a point where it can kind of even out in that kind of the money that's being put into kind of helping preserving the heritage, obviously kind of through for interest or just for preservation preservation's sake? If that's kind of going down and the social and community aspect is going up a little bit, do you see a point where people like yourself and you're doing can actually then kind of really help this side of the, this side of the scope as well? It depends on whether you mean funding going down in balance of the other or whether because for me it'd be the idea. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. Um, I think the difference is, is, is justifying it, having just put in a justification on why you need to spend money. And I, I think archaeology in Britain needs to come out firing all the cylinders, but not from the heritage angle, just to say, look, how many people go out and, because um, there's loads of stats saying, oh, how many people go into the heritage sites, great. What I want to say is, how many calories are burnt every year by people visiting heritage sites? How many uh, cases of depression are, or social isolation are tackled because of community groups doing heritage projects? Uh, how many uh, uh, sites have been left environmentally more biodiverse because of this? Um, because there's money for all of them for, for that. But my, the thing is, you should be from the same pot. There's loads of different pots. Um, so what I'd say is preservation and um, you know that side of kind of preserving heritage is a sacrosanct budget, and to put, I think how we engage and communicate heritage can, can come from the whole whole scattered one of different different funded pots. Personally, I, I don't think that I think it has got so many benefits, but we only seem to kind of wax local in our own circles about the heritage benefits. When in fact, maybe we need to do a you know a real kind of year long study into what the you know the, the, the more kind of less measurable benefits to, to heritage. So does that count for me or not? Yeah, it's just kind of how one can even on with obviously literally the money you right. to say, but I mean I don't know how, how could it even have profile to kind of support more investment in the heritage side of it. But what you're suggesting the social side of it justifies supporting more of the heritage side. Of it. You see what I mean? Yeah, I mean it, it's it's supply and demand demanded. There's enough people who want to see something happen and it will and it, it again comes to my argument about young people is that the work that like Yak does, you can kind of quite easily just say, oh yeah, it's fun for kids to come along and stuff, but not really. You're getting young people to understand the importance of archaeology because they're going to be voting in like 10 years' time. Um, so in, in that sense, it, 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 outreach will can impact on, on the other side of the yeah. thing if in that, in that kind of less measurable but votey type way where people say, well, I don't want to see that destroyed, so I'm going to vote, you know, with that type of thing. So I think they are... It is that kind of pendulum, but I think, for me, I'd swing, I'd put all the money, well, I'd put a lot more focus on the outreach because it will, you know, wash over to the other side, basically, so. Okay. Any more questions? No? I'm not giving any money away, that's why. I'm going to take everything back to the minute break, so perhaps I'll be chatting about some more questions. Yeah, no worries. Over a drink and some more food, but thank you very much. Yeah, no worries. I think you're enthusiastic. Thank <laughs> you.